Laura is a natural teacher. She has run classes and workshops for renowned universities, festivals, and community groups. She says she is always available for speaking and teaching engagements. Laura and her husband, Kunal Khanna, shifted from Australia to India in 2018 to fulfill their dream project, the odd gum nut in Panchagani at his family, family's farm. She believes the revolution begins at home. According to Laura, permaculturists are on a mission for a more resilient future for all. She says it's high time for all of us to do some critical thinking, to fundamentally question the system, to radically reskill ourselves, to return to a life that is grounded, nourished, and 100% woke. I read a very interesting quote on Laura's website written by Vandana Shiva, who is a famous ecologist. Oh. <laughs> I could not stop myself to share with you all. It goes like this. Food, after all, is life. Every time you eat, you can make a massive change. You can throw your weight behind ecosystems, behind diversity, behind farmers. Or you can throw your weight behind greed, behind super profits, behind ill health that is killing both this planet and its people. Make your choice. It's easy. I'm sure all of you must have liked it. <laughs> Laura, I'm yes. keen to know about what made you put this quote on your website. I'm really impressed. Please let us know later on during your talk uh, what made you put this. Uh, I will love to hear about it. Uh, uh, Laura declares her, herself to be producer. Her farm brims with that Shiva's motto is gain joy from dirt. And music puller. And this picture I'm sure Laura is going to share uh, all this with us today and much more. So, let's learn a lot from you today. Great. Thank you. That was Thank such you. a time. <laughs> And, and I'm through with all of you women today. I think what you are doing by coming together as female scientists and continuing your education across many different disciplines, that's absolutely what we should all be doing as we continue to go through life. We should always be learning. I'll introduce you to a bit more of the concept of permaculture on the whole. And then we're going to dive into growing, specifically how to grow vegetables, permaculture style, and more specifically in an urban setting, because I believe many of you are in urban settings, and I know the IWSA Learning Garden is also in an urban setting. Permaculture is quite an umbrella term, and there are many ways you can take it. We can talk about agroforestry or animal husbandry or uh, raising crops or running a household. All of these kind of different things fit in under permaculture, but today we're gonna focus on growing vegetables. So before I go further, I will speak to why I chose that Vandana Shiva quote. And I, I've been studying since university, so I graduated university over 12, 13 years ago now. And in my university, I, I created a major on food studies. At the time, there was no major that had to do specifically with food. 
However, there were many classes, whether it was from political science to ethnic studies to anthropology or geography or botany, all of these different departments had classes that wove in food and food politics, its production and consumption, and uh, the issues that are with that, for example, the Green Revolution. But there was nothing ever that had woven them together. So I, I wove them together. I ended up uh, creating a major that was an independent studies major, where I pieced it together all of these different food classes. So that exists now still as a minor at my university. But Vandana Shiva was someone who I studied all throughout university. And that quote of hers sums up so much how, so much of what I believe, which is that every decision we make from every single thing we purchase is a vote with our dollar for a system. And we can be, we can use our dollars very, con or our rupees very conscientiously so that we are not supporting systems that we don't ourselves as humans ethically support. So why would I buy clothing from somewhere where that's a wasteful industry that's polluting our rivers and has uh, you know, labor that has too long of hours and poor working conditions? Why would I buy vegetables and crops and chini from industries that are equally polluting, that are not treating their farmers right, where farmers are committing suicide? So every chance, every time you buy something, you're voting for not just that product, that entire system. And, and so that's what that Vandana Shiva quote says to me, is that we, all of this change, we really must, it really must start from the bottom. I have no belief that any of our governments in any of our countries can solve these issues for us. They're too in, embedded with business. And it is up to us, the people, to change systems through how we consume, how we purchase, how we live and eat and, and function. So that's to answer that. And now through this presentation, I'm going to share my screen. I have a little visual presentation and I find with permaculture, which is such an aesthetic uh, approach to land management, that having some photos in there is really important. So I'll just go ahead and do that right now. Okay, here we go. I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. So this, not yet. Uh, oh, you can watch it. Can you others can see? Others are able to see? Yes, we yes, can see. Yes, oh, I yes. can oh, see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Laura, please go ahead. Okay, great. So why this is so important right now is because we are in this moment of pause. We're in this period of COVID. I want you to just take a second and take in this graphic. You know, on the left, we have what was the normal situation, flying and driving everywhere, sitting in an office, working on a computer, going to a mall. Now we're in this time of COVID where things are a bit quieter, the skies have cleared, birds have returned. And instead of simply going back to that quote, normal, this is the most critical time we have in our life to reevaluate and find a new way forward a way forward that is more equal, where we are putting farmers at the front of things, where we're putting our health at the front of things, where we're questioning the systems that have told us how to be clean and healthy and all of these things, that maybe we can look back more to an ancestral way of living for a better way forward. So this is myself and my husband Kunal. Uh, this is at a farmer's market that we founded in Panchkani, an organic farmer's market that we run. And we run the Odd Gum Nut. So the Odd Gum Nut is a permaculture farm. We're a one acre farm in Punchkini. Here's just a little snippet of some veggies in the background. You can see uh, our greenhouse and a composting toilet, some more vegetable beds. When we got to this land two years ago, the land was completely barren. There was nothing there but very, very hard, red, rocky, laterite soil. And we have not even been here two years. It'll be two years in November. I wish I could show you the land today in this moment for how incredible, how incredibly nature responds when you give her a chance and when you work within her patterns. So let's talk about first, what is permaculture? Actually, before I go to this slide and we have all that text, I'll just start by saying permaculture is a movement that comes out of Australia in the 1970s and primarily from a man named Bill Mollison. Bill Mollison 
he really took his learning from the forest. Uh, and through his learning from the forest, he used to work in, in landscape kind of departments and realized there was just a lot that he didn't agree with and a lot that he didn't feel made sense with technical approaches to ecological issues. So he took his learning from the forest and from the Australian Aboriginal community, which is the indigenous community there, the longest living civilization on earth. And through this, he got a student named David Holmgren and he and David Holmgren joined to write many of the permaculture textbooks and, and then kind of spread that movement, which is now absolutely all over the world. So permaculture, and I'll just read from here for this. So why take the permaculture approach? Permaculture is holistic, ethical, and an intelligent approach to designing land and systems. It integrates rather than segregates. It keeps design at the center, and it is centered around energy efficiency. How can we partner with nature and work with her instead of against her? Permaculture regenerates the land, it increases biodiversity, and it produces in abundance. Permaculture is always aesthetic. We have a real focus on aesthetics because we know that if something is beautiful, our human, our human uh, you know, inclination will be then to spend more time in it and with it and to nurture it. It's always organic. So we can talk a bit more about what organic means because from a certification standpoint, it doesn't mean much, but permaculture is always, always using uh, natural approaches. So there will never be chemical, chemical inputs in permaculture. And it's regenerative in the same way that a forest is regenerative. That if we leave a forest or a jungle alone, will it degrade on its own? No, absolutely not. It will get richer, more diverse, more and, and stronger and more resilient as time goes on. So permaculture is always taking a regenerative approach where how can we, how can we um, increase the succession of a place? How can we accelerate succession to get any single patch of barren dirt back to a place of real diverse livelihood? Permaculture design techniques, they establish productively interactive systems. So permaculture stands for permanent agriculture. If you put that together, you have permaculture. So we're looking for systems that are inspired by patterns of nature and that are permanently ongoing. We're trying to create permanent systems within our land. It integrates all the elements in the same way that nature does. So that means plants, animals, people, insects, wild energies, all of this is integrated into a robust and balanced system that is self-perpetuating. It protects against extreme conditions increases resilience to climate change, and provides adaptation techniques. It is an answer for many of us for also this catch-22 of modern living. Permaculture is very much not just about growing vegetables, growing forests, growing crops. Permaculture is a way of life, a mentality, a way of solving problems and uh, a way of structuring our, our homes and our lives. So if we look at this, the catch-22 of modern living, which is that we spend more money we, and thus we have no time because we're working. So we're working so much that we have no time. We spend so much money that we then have no, much, no money and so we have to work more. And this cycle continues and continues and continues. Permaculture puts an emphasis on instead of being a consumer, and this doesn't matter where you live, if you're in a city or if you're in a village, this applies equally. That instead of always being a consumer, where you're, being, you're at the forces of the market and at the forces of having to go to work and at the forces of maintaining your job, if you can become more of a producer for yourself, and if you can think in alternative economies, then all of a sudden the need for money is less. Of course, the need for money never goes away, but the need for money is less and thus the time you might have could be more. And you could spend that time doing more nourishing things that are productive as well. So permaculture is rooted on three ethics and then is followed by a set of principles. It is these ethics and principles that bind and unite all of us as permaculturists. And it's why it makes it so easy to get along with and to work with permaculturists because if you subscribe to permaculture, then you subscribe to these ethics. And these ethics are, oops, are, um, you can see it in the upper right hand corner, are earth care, people care, and fair share. So taking care of the earth, which means 
Bhumimata, nature, in all of her living forms, uh, every plant and animal and protozoa and amoeba and bacteria, not just in our human form. But of course, we need to also take care of people. So that means paying a fair wage, um, working in systems where, where people are getting treated well, are not getting abused. And fair share is about reinvesting the surplus and also about applying self-regulation, that you only, only take as much as you need. And beyond that point, regulate and reinvest that surplus back into the greater or back into the whole. Fair share also speaks to the notion that it, we are not in this alone. So much of the issues we are in is because humans tend to be very human centric in how we believe, how we function and how we act in this world. But fair share is recognizing that there are many of us that share this planet and that we, we must, uh, you know, if the monkeys come and steal a bit of my bananas, that's okay. I'm gonna forgive that a little bit and I'll just make sure I plant one extra banana tree to take care of him and take care of me. So then we have these sets of principles and these permaculture principles, if ethics are, you know, the, the, are, if ethics are the house in which we live, then the principles are guidelines and guideposts for how we go about solving problems. So we'll talk through some of these. Some main ones are observe and interact, meaning that the very first thing you should do whenever you're approaching not only a natural system, but even a man-made system is first observe. What is nature doing? Where is the wind blowing? Where is the water running? Is it pooling anywhere? What season are certain fruits coming in? What bugs are, are attracted to certain plants? First observe nature and then interact with her. This is very much how Fukuoka, as was mentioned in the introduction, how Fukuoka uh, also managed his land. That we have to first observe nature before we can understand any way to interact with her. And through observation, we most often find our answers. Another principle is catch and store energy. You could even say, make hay while the sun shines. Catch and store energy means that there is wild energy all around us, from wind to sun to water. And we want to capture that energy to the best of our ability and use it. So instead of using non-renewables, we are using things that, that are already, already flowing through our site. Of course, we have to obtain a yield. If we don't have the principle of obtain a yield, look, humans, we need to see a profit and we need to see something lining our pockets for the work we've done. It's very rare that a human can go through life only giving and giving and giving and giving without running out of that energy. Of course, Gandhiji is a great example of that, but there are not many Gandhijis in this world. So many of us need to obtain a yield of some kind, get something back for what we're doing, whether in the form of, of food or of fiber or of clothing or textiles or money, but we need to get something back for our work. Otherwise, it's very easy to lose steam. Then apply self-regulation and accept feedback, meaning leave your ego at the door, be willing to accept feedback from those who are younger, older, smarter, less smart, whatever it is than you, and, and self-regulate. Check yourself. And use and value renewable resources and services. This one is pretty obvious, but uh, I mean, uh, an example we might not think of is for example, instead of me going to have to weed my whole bottom patch, which is a quarter acre and it's a fruit orchard, in the end of monsoon, it is full of weeds. So yes, I could go and use my energy, but I could also get my neighbor's cow to come over and eat all of this different weeds and grass, which is a great service for her, a renewable energy for sure, far more renewable than a weed whacker or a lawnmower. And, uh, and yeah, something where I'm using a biological resource. In permaculture, we also produce no waste, or we can also think of this as waste as resource. That in nature, there is never waste. Any, anything and everything is ready to be transformed and transmuted into energy for something else, ready to get decomposed back into soil to become energy for plants. Uh, so there is never waste. Even you know, dead and rotting animals, they're still not waste. Those are food for vultures and for other animals that eat carrion. 
So there is no waste in nature. And in permaculture, we also live by the same principle, that there is no waste. We just need to come up with creative solutions to repurpose. An example would be we've built a composting toilet on our property because human waste is a huge burden, a huge burden on society. How much water goes into trying to filter and clean uh, black water, sewage water? Sewage water is also polluting our riverways. It's a, a big issue for humanity. Instead of thinking of it as a wasteful product where we actually have to create more waste in the processing of it, we can intelligently design systems to compost our human manure and then after one or two years time, all of that turns into to black compost, which we can use on our fruit trees. So that's something that was one of the very first things we built on our site was a composting toilet so that even our human waste can become a resource. We also design from pattern to detail. This is speaking to observing the patterns in nature and then going from these patterns of branching patterns to spirals to scatter patterns and using those in how we're creating our designs because pattern follows, you know, form follows function. And so a pattern is the manifestation of an efficient function. So if we can take that and put them into our homes and our uh, gardens, then we're going to be working with nature automatically. We also want to integrate rather than segregate. Conventional agriculture would have a row of corn next to a row, next to a field of jowar, next to a field of paddy, next to a field of brinjal. In permaculture, everything is integrated. Plants, animals, trees, food crops, all of these things are integrated into one and have a lot more resilience that way. We also want to use small and slow solutions. So do things step by step, then go back to principle number one of observe and interact, and then make another step. We use and value diversity. That is both in plants, in people, and in animals. We use the edge and value the margin. So this might mean, you know, if we think about where two ecosystems meet, say where land meets riverbank or where land meets water, where land meets river, that riverbank, that middle, uh, that overlap of the Venn diagram between two ecosystems is one that has far more biodiversity than in either of the single ecosystems on their own. So to actually try to create more places where ecosystems touch each other and can interact with each other in order to create more biodiversity. And we also want to creatively use and respond to change. Change is only a problem if we make it a problem. Change is the only constant. So for example, even a situation like COVID, how can we take that and creatively respond to that and be positive about that and just look for ways to shift and pivot rather than get stuck in, in uh, the depression of something not going the way we wanted it to go. So whenever we're starting, so that was a review of the ethics and the principles. And that governs all of permaculture. Now, these other terms of you know, natural farming from Fukuoka or zero budget natural farming or Korean natural farming, all these other methods of natural farming fit under the great umbrella of permaculture. Because as you saw, we're guided by those ethics and those principles. So if, if we're now talking about how to grow vegetables in a permaculture way, which is gonna be the focus of this talk, the very first thing we want to do is, is observe, observe our land, observe the people that we have on that land, observe their needs, and also set some goals for ourselves. Uh, setting goals might be what kind of crops we want to eat throughout the year, how do we want to eat, how do we want to incorporate those foods. Goals might also be things like, do we want a surplus of a certain high value product that we can trade for something else that we might not grow ourselves. Maybe we can grow high quality floral teas on the perimeters of our gardens so that we can trade that for high quality milk or high quality ghee from someone else in our community. And along with observation, that leads us now into sectors. Sectors is a term we use in permaculture to denote all of the wild energies that we have on site. So, and, and all of the things that we don't have any real um, initial control over, things that are already happening on whatever site we're talking about. So of course we would want to think, where is the wind coming from? 
And does that change season to season? We might have monsoon winds that come from one direction and hot summer winds from another. And then we could use permaculture solutions to potentially invite in the cooling monsoon winds and block out the hot summer winds by using, by using a windbreak made of trees. So where does the water flow and what is our access to water? Where is that water coming from? Is it coming from a bore well, an open spring well? Is it coming from a water tank? And uh, what kind of, yeah, what is the access to that? Is there water all year round or are we living in somewhere that is water scarce? Another sector, of course, is how does the sun move? And this is incredibly important for growing vegetables, is where is the sun in the sky above us? And, and thus, where is the shadow? And then understanding how that might change throughout the year. Of course, in India, we're, we're much closer to the equator than in places where I'm from, so it doesn't change too much throughout the year. But understanding in an urban setting, what tall rise, high rise buildings might be blocking out of blocking the sun from our land so that we know where to put our garden beds and where to put maybe a garden bed of something that wants something shady. Or maybe in the shade is where you put your, your, biogas, uh, your biogas plant or where you would dig a root cellar. So understanding how sun and shade and how to work with them. And then what other things are on site? For example, even is there, are there very noisy neighbors that you want to block that noise out? Is there a very unsightly view that you want to block out? Is there a beautiful view that you want to invite in? Understanding all of these different parts of our property so we can know what we want to keep and what we want to create natural systems to block out. And what are our access paths? Where do we have road access? Where do we have foot access? Where do we have disability access? And I guess this one should have been earlier with the water, but where does water pool in the rain? Or does all of our water sink down into the ground? Or do we have sections that are flooding or, and sections that are very dry? So understanding where water pools and where it sits. In, we would map this out in permaculture by using something kind of like this. Let me just see, did I add, no, by using something kind of like this, where we map our sectors. So understanding where the wind is coming from, where the sun is going, how that changes throughout the year, where we're getting significant shade, and then uh, the two orange and yellow circles he has in there, this drawing, that would be the summer sun and the winter sun, and understanding where those are coming from. So we often map out our sectors physically, and in permaculture, we do lots of physical drawing in order to understand how different pieces of this puzzle are going to fit together. Now, in an urban setting, this is a really good graphic to understand the relative importance of sun, water, and soil at different scales. So at a scale like, like mine, that is a large, pretty large scale, I mean, not pretty, it's not large, one acre is still, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's not huge. However, for me, what is most important is nourishing my soil. Because on a piece of land that is one acre, I guarantee I can find enough sunny spots, you know, enough spots where the sun is shining. If we look at an urban, at an urban level or a very small level, you know, growing in a container or a courtyard or an urban plot, what is most important is sunshine. Because that's also what is toughest to get. You know, if you are on a, on a, a north facing balcony in the city, you are not going to get sun. You know, it just, it'll evade you completely and you will not be able to grow there. So that's why on an urban setting, your most important thing you need to look at is your access to sunlight and how the sun is hitting your property. And on a huge, large, large scale, where we're talking about hectares and many, many acres, then what's most important is not necessarily our soil because we can do lots of things like graze animals on soil that is poor, but what is most important for us there is our access to water. Just a nice graphic to keep in mind at the relative scales of importance. Then we also use, we also, yeah, we, we need to know where our wind is coming from. This is part of our sector analysis and wind can significantly impact the growth of your vegetable garden or the growth of your orchard. So it's important to understand where the wind is coming from and if there are any wind tunnels that are created from tall urban buildings that is going to shoot wind harshly into your property. 
in permaculture, we would solve this with something we call a windbreak. And a windbreak would be, just as is written here, multi-species and multi-row uh, group, grouping of trees, where they make kind of this pyramid or triangle shape, but that are not such a dense canopy that we're blocking all of the wind. We want spindly canopied things where wind is going to flow through but get dissipated quite a lot. So if you're in an urban plot that is in the middle of a wind tunnel created by other buildings and wind is pummeling into your site, then it's very important to consider a windbreak that would look something like this because uh, too much wind can really affect the growth of vegetables. In an urban setting too, we need to make sure that we're mapping out access. This is something that, this is why we design permaculture sites first on paper before we implement them, because we must understand all of our systems, really holistically look at our land, our goals, and then understand where we need access, because it's uh, very easy to just start growing and going about things, but then realize that you can't get the, the car from the greenhouse to the road, and thus how are you gonna get in all of these tons of potting mix, and how are you gonna get out all of your many trays of seedlings. So very first important is to figure out your access. And then to figure out your water. Uh, what do I have after this? Yeah, so we in permaculture talk a lot about reusing our gray water. And we talk about cleaning our black water. So gray water is anything coming from your sink or your shower or the kitchen. Yeah, that, or the, the washing machine or maybe from when you washed your car or your dog, any of these things would be gray water, anything that's non-sewage. Black water is of course sewage. So we can create systems that eliminate black water altogether, for example, a, a dry composting toilet. We can also clean black water with reed beds. However, on an urban scale, that's not feasible because you need quite a lot of land to do that. But gray water is something that you can easily integrate in. So wherever you're growing, if it's in an urban setting, your gray water system might look as simple as this, which is maybe you collect instead of your, the drain from your kitchen going through the wall and out the house, instead you can cut that pipe off so it just goes into a bucket right below you, and then you take that out and you physically dump that on your trees. There are many more uh, much easier solutions to gray water that don't have to be so labor intensive where you're setting up direct routing systems. But considering your water and its usage is critical. How can we clean and reuse our water, give it all a second, third, or fourth life before we let it leave our property? So growing permaculture style means that we're growing in a polyculture. Uh, it means, yeah, so we'll get into all of these things this is now what we'll come up and get into. So it means growing in a polyculture, using heirloom, non-hybrid, and non-GMO seeds. It means mulching and building soil. It means water efficiency and using gray water. Integrating animals. Integrated pest management instead of wiping out all pests as we do with fungicides and pesticides. And it also means stacking functions. So now we'll get into these. A polyculture as compared to a monoculture. A monoculture would be uh, you know, a single patty of rice or a huge, you know, just a whole patty or a whole field of jawar, a whole field of corn, a whole field of tomatoes, etc. It means just one single crop. A polyculture means that your crops are completely and always creatively intermixed. And polycultures serve many, many purposes. It's not just that you've diversified your yield. But if we look at this image that's right in front of us, we have what we can see at the bottom are nasturtiums, that red flower. Then we have calendula, that yellow flower. And behind that, I have then rows of some vegetables. So mixed in there is some rainbow chard and some kale and some arugula. You may or may not be familiar with these vegetables. These are seeds I've brought from, uh, from overseas because they're foods that I've grown up with and I also like to eat them. I also grow lots of daisy seeds, but I've mixed, you know, my garden is quite mixed. So what these plants are doing is they are managing pests in place. Nasturtium, which is a completely edible and perennial plant, 
In permaculture, we put lots of emphasis on plants that are perennial as opposed to annual. So annual meaning that that plant goes through its whole life cycle in one season, from seed back to seed, it'll produce seed. And perennial meaning that it will keep on going for many, many seasons to come. It could be, you know, it could be indefinitely. So a nasturtium, which is a perennial plant that grows very easily, you can use the pods to pickle like a caper, you can eat the leaves and you can eat the flowers. And you could also get high to, quite a high price in the market for selling those edible flowers to different high class restaurants and you know, um, five star restaurants and five star hotels. But in the garden, what it's also doing is it has a very strong smell and scent kind of mustardy and pests hate it. It deters pests from your garden because they can't handle such a strong smell and pests are guided mostly by sense of smell. A similar thing with this calendula, another strongly scented plant that pests tend to avoid. And this also doubles as a medicinal plant that you can take if you have acid reflux or peptic ulcers or a range of different gastric disorders. So all of these are serving multiple purposes within our system. And that's what I mean by stacking functions. But as we see here in a polyculture, we are never growing a single row of a single thing. We're always integrating different crops with, diff with, uh, with different flowers, different nitrogen fixers, all to create a healthy and diverse ecosystem. It also means we're always using heirloom seed. A permaculture grower will never use hybrid seed. This, gosh, this is a big topic and a big conversation about genetically modified seeds and hybrid seeds. But at the root of it, if we're not getting into any of the political ownership that these chemical companies have over plant genetics, instead, let's just talk on a, on a real um, level of the garden, which is that it is only heirloom seed that have the inherent strength and fortitude to continue to get better year after year and, and uh, adapt themselves to your environment and your garden. And we use hybrid and GMO seeds. They do not have genetic resilience in and of themselves. They've been cre created for certain phenotypical characteristics, like uh, you know, a nice juicy red fruit, but they have not been created to be resilient. Thus, they depend on chemical fertilizers, chemical pesticides, chemical herbicides and chemical fungicides. All of those things continue to deteriorate our soil, continue to have cause algae blooms in our ecosystems and cause genetic mutations in our aquatic species. So there is no uh, reason to go the route of a hybrid seed. Heirloom seed is the result of thousands and thousands and thousands of years of humans working with the earth, tending to the earth, to get something that is valuable for us. So let's honor those thousands and thousands and thousands of years of connection and continue to work with heirloom seed. It really is the only way of the future. Now, permaculture, we know that if we honor the soil and if we focus all of our efforts on building soil, then the plants will grow themselves. We don't need to worry so much about how to grow vegetables Instead, we need to worry about how to grow soil. The first part of that is recognizing the soil food web. That under the earth, inside healthy soil, we have trillions of different kinds of things going on. Mm -hmm. So uh, things from nematodes to fungi to bacteria and protozoa, and then all of the different actual animals that are going around down there, different worms and different moles. All of this stuff is happening under the soil. And it is quite, uh, I soon think that we will look back at a time of tilling the soil and realize how barbaric in nature that was. That idea of taking what is underneath and exposing it all to the top means that you are killing off this very fine balanced web of different species all working together to create things that are inert and locked up and transmuting them and transforming them into something that is plant food. So first is recognizing the soil food web and the diversity that is under the soil, which means we practice a type of no-till agriculture. This is very different than the traditional 
plowing that we might see in a field where we turn down from, you know, from what was down and expose it up to the earth, thus destroying that delicate food web in the soil and also bringing weed seeds to the top and creating a much bigger job for the farmer. Because when we take weed seeds, which tend to inhabit a deep place in the soil, and we turn that soil and expose them to the surface, we allow them to photosynthesize and thus grow weeds. In a no-till system, what you see in front of you in this photo is something we call a broad fork. And this is a tool where you step it down into the dirt and you shift it just a little forward and back and pull it back out. So a completely manual process that just aerates the soil. So it's opening up air pockets, which is also what your soil food web is doing, but it's never turning it over. So it's okay to aerate soil and to allow for more penetration of roots, more penetration of fertility, but it is never okay to turn it, to completely turn what was down and bring it up. In a similar vein, we also mulch the soil. Here is a little um, baby broccoli seedling and around it you can see straw. Now mulch can be any dry carbon material. It can be uh, shindana chilka, or it can be dry leaves. It can be penda. It can be any of the straw after a wheat harvest. Laura, ex oh, yes. Laura excuse me. Sorry for mm -hmm. disturbance. Uh, I think the other people, uh, is there, everyone is not able to see the presentation? We are able to is see. That? Okay. Uh, those who are not able, yeah, no, Krishna, no, 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 I can see. Some yeah. Krishna has spent it. Yeah, Krishna oh, yeah, has yeah, yeah. He is uh, Laura's mother-in-law. <laughs> okay, okay, welcome. Uh, okay. Why don't uh, I continue? continue. I'll Sorry to this. I'll stop sharing it and then I'll try sharing it again, and let's okay. see if. Fine. Okay. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see this. Yes. Great. Uh, yes, yes. yes, we can see. Yes, Mama, please. can you see? Yeah. <laughs> I can see. Okay. I'll continue. So yeah. it also means a similar vein of honoring the soil and the soil food web. It means that all of that life under the soil, if we have that dirt exposed to the sun, we are constantly evaporating nutrients and moisture from the soil with the energy of the sun. And I'll just suggest whoever still has their mic on to please uh, turn off your mic. Yeah, great. So when we mulch the soil, it means putting any kind of dry carbon material and laying it on top meaning around the plants. So you'll always keep your plant free of mulch, of course, and around the plant, like a little blanket, tuck it in and keep mulch on top. Mulch does multiple things for us. First of all, it keeps moisture inside of our soil and where there is water, there is life. So uh, the presence of water in soil allows for all of these different transactions to occur and allows for all of this range of soil food web to stay alive and thriving. It also means that, yeah, our soil is not going to be leached of nutrients and of energy from the sun. And then in time, whatever we're laying down as mulch, be it groundnut chilka or penda, all of this is organic matter and it will eventually break down and become soil. So we're, when we mulch and that breaks down and becomes soil, we simply mulch on top of that again. And we're always layering mulch material on top of our soil, knowing that that is going to be a constant cycle of breaking down and turning into humus. We also use lots of nitrogen fixers. Nitrogen fixers are certain types of plants, often leguminous, that host a bacteria on their root nodule, which is exactly what we see in front of us. And it is that bacteria hosted by the root nodule that allows for uh, a for a synthesizing of atmospheric nitrogen into soil nitrogen. So then that puts that nitrogen all through the roots and the leaves and the stalks of that plant, which we can then go along with 
and uh, break off different leaves as it grows, lay those back down on the soil, and that all becomes nitrogen for the soil to take up. And we add compost. And compost can look in multiple ways, but often it means that's a combination of your food waste plus some dry leafy material, similar thing that you might use for mulch. You allow that to sit together, aerating it about once a week, turning it about once a week. This is something you can do on your balcony. You do not need a patch of land for this. You can do this just even within a bucket. And that compost is super rich and full of nutrition, so we're always adding that to the soil every time we plant. Composting in a bigger setting, for example, if you had an urban community environment, could look like this, where you have different bays and you're turning it between each bay. Or we could compost in situ, in place. So I hope you guys can also see my mouse. This drawing is not the best, but this is a bucket. And inside this bucket, which is half sunken into the soil, there are lots of holes that have been cut into this bucket or drilled into this bucket. This now means that instead of composting separately in a composting system and then moving that finished compost to the soil, we can just compost in the soil itself. So you dig a bucket halfway down, dig some holes in it, and then every day with whatever food waste is coming out of your kitchen, you simply put that food waste inside the bucket, maybe mix in some dried leaves, put a lid with a nice big rock on top so you don't get rodents inside, and this acts like a restaurant or a hotel for worms to come in and out of. So they come in through the holes that you put in your bucket, and then they will come in, eat some food, and go throughout your soil, digesting and pooping, which is exactly what you want them to do, because they are turning material that your plants can't access into a perfectly beautiful casting, a worm casting that your, your plant can take up as nutrition. So this also then cuts any of the work out of creating a composting system, because you can simply compost right in the place that, that you want the nutrition to go to. It also means that you should test your soil. Soil, you know, soil science is, uh, huge and vast and a bit complex. There's pH, you know, there's acid and alkaline soil, and there's different, different minerals that can bind to each other and lock each other up. So you want to, before you start growing, do a test of your soil. Especially you want to be seeing what is your calcium to magnesium ratio. These should be in a ratio of four to one, and that is ideal for plants to uptake that. Plants very much need calcium and magnesium. And even if they're both abundant inside your soil, they can be abundant but unbalanced. And then actually they lock each other up and it cannot get taken up by the plants. Now soil is uh, something that you can build. Not, you're not always going to come to a plot and it's gonna have beautiful rich black humus on it. In fact, I would bet that that's probably never going to happen anymore in our modern world. So the image you see in the upper right hand corner, or sorry, upper left hand corner, is what our soil looked like on day one when we arrived. We did a process called sheet mulching. Sheet mulching is a permaculture term for layering brown and green and brown and green layers on top of each other. So a green layer might, is something that is nitrogen rich. So that might mean compost or manure. Often that means manure different kinds of manure. That can be pigeon manure or horse manure or cow manure or goat manure, any kind of manure, although different manures need to be treated a bit differently. And a brown layer would be a carbon layer. So that could be uh, any kind of plant material like what we have as the stalks of sugarcane that were a free resource where we are, or cardboard, or penda, straw, hay, etc. You layer these in a brown-green ratio, like making a lasagna, and then you wait for that to break down. Now, the layer of cardboard is an important one at the bottom because that suppresses any weed growth. If weeds cannot photosynthesize, then of course they cannot grow. So if we're blocking all sunlight from reaching weed seeds, it means we won't get any weeds in our system. This is also something that if you have a patch in an urban area, a patch of grass, and you wanna convert that lawn or that grass into a place where you can grow food, then sheet mulching is the perfect solution because you don't need to rip out that grass. Instead, you layer cardboard down as the thing to block the sun out and then continue to layer organic material on top. 
This is now what our soil looks like. So you can see the image here in the upper left, how red and rocky and hard and inert that is. And now compare that to what you see right in front of you, which is rich and absolutely black. The blacker our soil means the more the organic matter, means the higher the water holding capacity, the more nutrition, etc. When you have soil like this, then plants simply grow themselves. So we also continue to fertilize our soil with different natural fertilizers. Jivamrut has been made in India for centuries, and it's something that zero budget natural farming also talks a lot about. If you want to screenshot this page, please go ahead, because here's the recipe for Jivamrut. But it's simple, simply a combination of cow dung, cow urine, basin, and gourd. And all of that is combined. It's stirred for two, for two days and then diluted one to 10. So 10 parts water to one part jivam root and sprayed on all of your plants. If you're using daisy cow dung and daisy cow urine, then you're going to get the whole range of micronutrients in that jivam root uh, that you need for your whole garden. So we also are always looking at water efficiency. We know that water is becoming increasingly scarce and that it is irresponsible for us to think that we can go on using flood irrigation and using bore wells without having any consequence. India's water table has dropped 70% in a decade. These are facts that should shock us and should really make us look at our own personal practices. So a water efficient system is one that is so rich in organic matter. For every bit of or more organic matter we add to our soil, uh, which would, you know, what we call humus, which is rich and full of organic matter, then it can hold that much more water. Your soil essentially becomes a sponge that can hold water, whereas a soil without any life cannot hold any water at all. Of course, then we mulch on top to leave to uh, eliminate evaporation. We often use drip irrigation because that goes right to the root zone at a targeted amount and, uh, and not very much, a lot less than using sprinklers or flood irrigation. We always reuse our gray water, trying to circle that water as many times as we can. We use swales. And let me just see if I put in a picture of a swale. Maybe I have in a bit. So a swale is essentially a ditch followed by a berm. And this is something that you would not use on an urban scale, but on a bit of a larger scale, especially important in places like the Deccan or in Rajasthan, where you're getting put rain that is sporadic and needs to be held in. So it would be held in the ditch and allowed to drip, uh, to drip down into the soil. It also means we harvest rainwater from any kind of surface, from a cow shed to a tool shed, to a home, to a building. It means we use composting toilets and we encourage you to just go pee outside on a tree. So here's that same image, image as before, but probably the easiest gray water, as in um, simplest, simplest gray water system you could have, which is just take that bucket of water and go dump it on the plants straight from kitchen to soil. You can also create a branching system out from any kind of a building. So this would be, and sorry for this pretty terrible image, but uh, this branching system would go then underground, subterranean, either up through a pipe or a dug ditch, and straight out to mulch under a tree. So if you're gonna use gray water without cleaning it or treating it first, it shouldn't be used for vegetables, but it's absolutely okay to use for fruit trees or anything that is more ornamental, for example, something like citronella that serves a purpose of mosquito repellent, but it's not something you're gonna directly eat. And you can just have that branch straight out under the soil via a pipe or a ditch. And as long as you're sending your gray water under mulch, meaning it's never open to air, then you don't need to worry about there being flies or insects that are attracted to it because it's going subterranean. Now, in permaculture, like in nature, we integrate animals. Nature does not garden alone. She has lots and lots and lots of animals that help her out, right? And there is no natural system where animals are not a, where, are not a part of it. Integrating animals gives us manure, which is highly beneficial. It's a fantastic nutrient source for our plants. Uh, they also, for example, of a chicken, they also have different characteristics. They might go scratching around, and that scratching and pooping in combination is something that gets uh, the nutrition of their manure down into the soil and also eliminates a lot of weeds and a lot of bad grubs. 
or bad bugs that might be in our soil. And we get products from animals. So we get, of course, eggs and meat and feathers and milk and, yeah, manure. In an urban setting, you know, because with more land than you would want, you would integrate larger animals. And you'd integrate animals based on your size, the size of your plot. But urban integrations that always work are keeping bees. Bees are in mass decline all over the world, and they are responsible for one third of our food supply. Without bees pollinating different crops, one third of our food supply would be immediately eliminated. Bees are dying in record numbers because of the use of pesticides and herbicides, which they then take up when they're getting nectar from a flower and they bring that back into their hive and that kills off whole hives. So keeping a small bee house gives you pollination and it potentially gives you honey. You can also collect pigeon droppings. There are pigeons all over urban areas and their poop is very high in phosphorus and in nitrogen. And we can integrate that into our composting system. And keeping quails. Chickens are a bit tough in a, in a very urban environment, something like Mumbai or Delhi, but a quail is a perfect solution for an urban environment because where chickens want to roam, they want pasture and they want space, but a quail, which is always going to be prey, very much have that prey mentality. So they actually want a space that is tight, small, contained, and not open. So you can very easily integrate quails into an urban setting by building them something called a deep litter system, which is maybe a big pen with lots and lots of, str of straw built up on the bottom. And they will give you eggs, they'll give you meat, and they'll give you uh, nutrient-rich manure. Now, we can't talk about gardening without talking about pests. And in permaculture, we use an approach called integrated pest management. So conventional agriculture would very simply spray pesticides and herbicides and fungicides and just wipe out all signs of life. This is only possible if you're using hybrid or genetically modified seeds that, are, um, that can withstand that fertilizer. We also have to remember that, sorry, that pesticide. We have to remember that GMO and hybrid seeds are made by chemical companies. They're not made by botanists or gardeners or farmers. They're made by chemical companies to withstand the chemicals that they want to sell to you as the real moneymaker. So instead of eliminating all life, we use that same principle of integrate rather than segregate. Segregate would be wipe it all out and create a sterile environment, meaning sterile soil that is just running off of the fertilizer you're pumping in. Integrating means that you're creating a diverse balanced system where if you're switching over to our organic for the first time, it may be that, uh, that the first couple years are full of pests as that system finds its place. But over time, as you create more flowers, more habitats for, for prey, then you start to manage that. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna get so much into this actually right now, but it would look like using hoops, instead of spraying sprays, it would look like um, creating habitats of rocks or of ponds for things like lizards and frogs who will eat other ones of your bugs. And it will look like planting lots of flowers all around your property to bring in predatory wasps and ladybugs that are gonna eat things like aphids. And lastly, we stack functions. So we know that one element, one element should serve multiple functions in our system and any one essential function should be served by multiple elements. So that gives you resilience. So this is an example of a, a gray water system that is also a worm farm. This very first, at the lower part of your screen, that's a worm farm that does the first cleaning and also the worms take up the nutrients of little bits of rice or pasta or whatever goes through your kitchen sink. So this is stacking functions. You're cleaning your gray water, but you're also feeding your worms at the same time. In this case, we wanna create some shade in a hot area. So instead of buying a plastic shade cloth that will never disintegrate ever, we can just grow vines up a trellis and we've created shade as well as given ourselves a space to have food. In this situation, this is a rockery and, a, and that is functioning as a rockery and a wall, but also a seating bench 
and also a place to grow certain herbs that like to be tucked into the rocks. So in this case, oregano, which then makes it probably a very lovely seating experience for whoever's sitting there getting to smell the oregano. And we choose multi-use plants. Multi-use plants, I mean, there are so many, but moringa, banana, papaya, coconut, aloe vera, ginger, turmeric, amaranth, and malabar spinach are all amazing tropical plants that every single one of us should be growing because of how multifunction they are. So garden bed design can look like this, a keyhole, things that are space efficient, uh, but yeah, they give you a lot of space, maximize your growing space while still having access. If this was a, a whole circle, then this person would not be able to access what is growing in the middle. But if you simply make a keyhole, then you have lots of growing space around you, very tightly compact, but also where we can reach it all. We use a lot of mandala beds because they're beautiful and they're aesthetic and they're, uh, they're a good space efficient way to grow. And we use spirals. Spirals create microclimates and it also means that the whole length of a garden bed can be stacked up on something that you can fit almost anywhere. This is a really good urban solution. And we use wicking beds. Wicking beds are things that, that water from the bottom. So this would be a sealed off raised bed where we pour water down to the bottom. You can see in the image quite clearly here that water is going down the pipe and then through that scoria or that base of rock at the bottom, plants roots are wicking through capillary action the water up through its roots. This means you're getting deeper rooted plants that are more resilient to temperature fluctuations, which is absolutely something that we need in a time of climate change. This is a finished wicking bed, what it might look like from the outside. Also with hoops for a net as an inter part of integrated pest management and with mulch as a soil protector. You can stack your functions even more by adding high trellises into your wicking beds. These are great in urban city situations because then you can also grow beans, loki, dudi, anything that is gonna creep up. You can even go as far as making a mini forest into a wicking bed by integrating a big, a large bed that is self-watering that integrates a tree. So in a urban setting, these are gonna be the most water efficient and most resilient ways to grow. And just like this, we now can be this crazy household in the middle of generic ones where we have taken a stand to be producers and we've taken a stand to work with nature to get the most out of her abundance. And that's how to grow veggies the permaculture way. So I'll stop sharing and I'll open it up to any questions. I think I may have gone um, a little bit over time. So sorry about that. But yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'm really happy to take them now and answer whatever you might be curious on. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Laura, for the wonderful session about growing your own herbs and vegetables and reaching us about permaculture, as you mentioned, in a design-based approach to land manage management. Mm -hmm. During your talk, I was just listening how nicely you explain permaculture with forest growing, the catch-22 of modern living cycle, taking us to ethics of permaculture and its principles, going for it step by step. We observe how to observe land and then set goals for it, talking about wind blowing, my God. Grey water using in garden, so many things you have covered. And not to forget about this making uh, restaurants for the worms in the basket. <laughs> so, <I know. laughs> that's wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I request uh, Superna, Dr. Superna Kamath from our technical team to display out the questions from the chat box. Great. Do we have? Yes, I can see them. Yeah, yeah. So would you like to read it yourself or should I read it for you? Laura? No, sure. I can read. That's no problem. Okay. Uh, so that first question, first are comments. So thank you for that, guys. And then the question of, are you using gray water directly? Is there a simple purification system? Fantastic question. You can use gray water directly if it's going to trees and if it is under mulch. That's how you can use it directly. And in fact, that's very efficient 
and very little effort. You can also clean your gray water, and this is mostly done in two ways. So you can do this uh, using material, being sand, small rocks, and larger rocks to create a filtration system where particles will settle down and then cleaner water will come to the top. And this is best used in tandem with using water cleaning plants. So canna indica, anything in the canna species are water cleaning plants. Lotus are also water cleaning plants. So if you can create a system where you have maybe a filter for all of the particles that might come out. So you have a first filter that you can change and then you have your water go through some sand and some sand and rock and end up in a pool full of water cleaning plants. Then you can use as a litmus test to understand if you, is your water clean. If you integrate in frogs and ducks, they will let you know if your water is clean because frogs and ducks they will not inhabit or go into dirty water. So if you've done a good job with your gray water system, then you'll have lots of frogs and ducks to show that, to show that. Which then leads us perfectly into this next question of, is detergent in the gray water um, suitable for vegetable growing? And Sureka and everyone, my answer is that detergent is no longer suitable on planet Earth at all. And we need to get it out of our systems completely. We need to go back to what all of your daddies and nannies were using, which was Rita and Shikakai. They're incredibly effective. I have not bought a single chemical for this home now in almost two years. And I don't see myself ever, I mean, I know I will never go back. We have the solutions already. Rita and Shikakai are abundant in India and we need to switch over our cleaning products to that. Um, in fact, if you're interested on this, head over to our website because that's something that I, I teach a lot of workshops on is how to switch your whole home off of a chemical based off of anything chemical because yeah they're not suitable for for gray water systems or for vegetables or for our bodies or for our rivers or for our oceans or for our planet they just need to get out uh so lots of questions about gray water great so i think then we can that's pretty much answered 